another edition of The Customer and the Service. I am Sean Petrasky, and with me as always is John Lamazny. Hello, John. How are you? Hey, Sean. How are you? It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. I'm uh, excited about tonight's episode, our 12th episode. Hard to believe that we are now uh, 12 plus hours deep into our adventure in customer service, but... That's a very interesting turn of phrase you just used there. Why is that? It's just, I, I like it. I okay. think we ought to make a third t-shirt. Third t-shirt indeed. We really should start doing this now because, you know, we have 800 people on Facebook to sell to. That's right. That's like $8,000 or more. That is. If everybody gave us a nickel, we'd have a couple bucks. We'd have a shit ton of nickels, too. It would. So, um, tonight's topic, main topic at least, um, is a spinoff from our previous episode. We had a, uh, I was, let's see, I'm going back in our notes here. It looks like it was our, poof, how long ago was this? We talked about it last time a little bit, uh, but it might have been two episodes ago. I think it was our Walmart episode, right? Episode 10, where we, we had a little bit of a side tangent about uh, the state of food and fast food and, and service uh, in these industries. And we started talking briefly about um, nutrition specifically. And we didn't want, we felt we were going a little bit off topic and we decided to table it for another episode. And tonight is that episode where we will be diving in further to the world of nutrition. Uh, and, um, you know, as we said last time, this is an area that is very, very important to John. Uh, it's an area that I'm just starting to, you know, uh, learn quite a bit about myself. And uh, I think it's pretty fascinating and actually, I think, says a lot about what's going on in America um, right now. So uh, why don't we uh, dive in? And go ahead. And uh, I think, uh, John, you said uh, to me earlier that there were some things that you said last last time that you wanted to clarify. So why don't we uh, start off with that and allow you to correct some uh, statements you made. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not necessarily a correction per se, but I, I felt like we were compressed for time and, and I guess the topic sort of snuck up on us and it's a really important topic to me. It's something that uh, the last time that I lost a lot of weight became really important to me and this time I've, I've really solidified that, that feeling. And the feeling is this, uh, especially in light of the way that we're talking about customer service sort of extending to friendship and extending to a whole bunch of other areas, customer service definitely applies to nutrition. And if I have a choice, and what is our conversation if not about choices and, and making the best choices in, in the services that we give money to and give attention to and, and keep going back to. If I have a choice between two places and one of them allows me to make really great nutritional choices and one of them really uh, might even have delicious food but does not help me to, to be fit or to be nutritionally aware or to try to keep my lifestyle in check, I am going to choose the place that tells me what I'm eating or it gives me some choices that are not unreasonable or allows me to know more about uh, the calories and other uh, ideas surrounding food that have almost to me become like a right. If I walk in somewhere and they can't tell me what the calories are in their food, I want to walk out. I mean, I might stay if, if it's like something I've really been looking forward to or whatever, but, or if somebody says to me, uh, that information's on our website, you know, my answer is, well, why is it not right here when I'm making the choice? Why do I have to go research this food when you already know the information and you're hiding it from me? Why, wh why would you not make that information available to me here now when I need it? That's customer service. Just like somebody treating me well, just like somebody going the extra mile, that's not even the extra mile. That's like, you know, that's just basic service to me now. And 
as sad as it makes me, you know, McDonald's is great at this. It, it makes me sad because they they have, have all the information available to you. It's it's available on your tray, and um, it it makes me sad because the food is such crap. Right. It's it's, it's tasty crap, but it's it's crap. You know, and, you know what the funny thing is about that since since you mentioned it, uh, they were like ahead of the curve on that. Like 20, yeah. 15 years ago, they had that giant poster right next to the cashier, which listed everything that they sold and gave you all the. I mean, nobody was even doing that at the time, and right. they had it, and that, that's I think worth commending them for. Well, I, I think that this speaks a little bit to the reason, the motivation for organizations to do this sort of a thing, and. Uh, unfortunately, the need, I think, was a moral need, a, a business moral need up until now. And um, for McDonald's, it was a legal need. It, it was something where uh, McDonald's was probably doing something preventative from a legal standpoint. They wanted to make their users aware of the kinds of things that they were eating so that nobody could come back and say, well, you didn't tell me that I was eating 2,000 cal my entire day's worth of calories in one sitting. Right. You know what I mean? Which you can do so easily. You can sit down, go to the dollar menu, spend $5, and eat two days' worth of food. Right. It, it's so easy to do. Yeah. Because the food is delicious, and adding oil is an easy way to add a lot of calories and to add a lot of deliciousness but not necessarily to add great nutrition right so but I, I'll give you another example I, I if I go to subway that information is readily available to me it's available on the menu now because of the laws that originated in New York and now have extended to be national law or federal law I should say uh, and just to be clear it refers to uh, part of Obamacare, which says that um, if you are a chain with with more than a certain number of restaurants, then you must provide nutritional information at the time of purchase in some reasonable way. And I guess there are guidelines um, for what that reasonability is. But it, it really is at the menu level. If I open up a menu or if I look at a menu on a menu board on the wall, I should be able to tell to some certainty what the calories are in the at least the calories. I want to know the rest of the information too, but for me, um, it is mostly about calories. And so when I look at three choices on a wall and one of them says 700, one of them says 400, and one of them says 200, I might choose the 700 depending on how many calories I've eaten today. But it's like... <clears throat> Think about um, if you are buying a computer or if you're buying a tablet or if you're buying um, a book or you're buying something else. Like, There's certain information that should be available to you that you just expect, like the price. As far as I'm concerned, calories are like money. Calories are a budget for me. And each day I have around 1,300 calories right now because I'm reducing. Uh, around 1,300 calories to spend. If I walk into uh, McDonald's or uh, any place where I'm buying food, they certainly are upfront with the pricing. If you, you would expect to see the price next to whatever it is that you're buying. That's, you see the title of what the food is and you see the price of it. To me, it's just as important, if not far more important, to see how many calories um, purchasing in that transaction too. So uh, tonight I was at Primo Hoagies in Ewing. Um, I, I can actually see the Ewing Diner from where I'm at right now. That's, that's awesome. Isn't that awesome? That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I went into Primo Hoagies and I was making a choice about what I was going to have that night. And not only did they have the calories on the menu, but they had a vegetarian section on the menu. Oh, I know. In a deli shop. Right. And they had several interesting choices. Right. To the point where I said, hmm, should I have that? Or should I have that? Or should I have that? Yeah, it wasn't like your obligatory veggie or cheese hoagie. It's yeah, it, 
it wasn't lettuce, tomato, onion, whatever. It was like roasted eggplant with roasted peppers. It was delicious too, yeah. by the way. Um, We're big fans of Primos here in our house. Yeah, I, I, it was my first time. I was a virgin tonight. Yeah, my so, girlfriend is a pescatarian and a former vegetarian and former vegan as well. And uh, she, you know, she lived in Philly for a while, and that's where Primos is from. And uh, she there's one right near where she works, and that's where she went for the first time. And she like she would come home and be like, "We have to we have to go to this place. It's amazing. The sandwiches are good." And then they open the one in Ewing, and it's like that's all she wrote. You know, we yeah. it's not we don't go there all the time, but you know, we split our time between there and a Tasty Sub Shop. You know, it's, it's yeah, a good, good place. Tasty's fantastic. Um, although if you go to Tasty, there's an example. Yeah, Tasty has exactly two restaurants in the in the greater Trenton area. They may have two restaurants in total. They do. One in there's one in Edison, which President Obama visited, and the one right. in Lawrence Hall. Right. So they are not held to the same standard that, um, let's say, Subway is or uh, even Primo's is because Primo's has at least 10 locations, right? I think maybe even more now. Yeah. So, I mean, Tasty Sub is taking a certain route, and I guess they're a family-owned business and whatever. But uh, Primo's, because of the law, they are, they are preceding the law with this action and going ahead and putting their calories available. I was not crazy about the idea that their vegetarian menu contains pescatarian items, uh, but it was better than nothing. And like I said, I'm a flexitarian. Like I'll, I'll have a little bit of everything, but right. <clears throat> um, it was nice to have a choice. It was nice that they were interesting choices that they considered more than one lifestyle, one mm -hmm. more than one nutritional lifestyle, and it was showing me not only responsibility in their actions as a company, but also it was showing me that they cared about me as a potential non-meat eater and that they cared about my health to some degree because they made that information available to me without being mandated to. They see the mandate coming perhaps. Well, I think... Uh, to, to clarify that, I think uh, Philadelphia or Pens Pennsylvania as a state has a similar law to New York City in that they have to declare the calorie content. And being that they are based out of Philadelphia, I think they just kind of – that menu just changed because be before, I guess, two weeks ago, yeah. the menu did not have calorie content on it. And I just noticed the last time we went in there that it was on there. I guarantee you that that was just – they are sending them to all the stores now just to be compliant. That's very possible. However, if I am not mistaken, the nutritional guidelines, the nutritional awareness guidelines that applied to New York State as a, as a leader in that uh, area yeah. are going to be applied nationally because of the passing of Obamacare. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I remember hearing that as well. Yeah. So I, they may just see that coming, and they they may say, you know, whatever, we'll do this. But since they had already had to do that, I guess for Pennsylvania, and certainly Pennsylvania needs it. <laughs> uh, it's it's great that they were able to apply it to their entire chain. Absolutely. But if I go to Tasty Sub, I have no idea what the. I mean, I have some idea what the calories are, um, but. They don't have any standardization. They, it's funny, too, because they do have standardization in the way that they make sandwiches. As a matter of fact, I've never seen a more mechanized way of making a sandwich than you see in Tasty Sub. Well, I, I, I beg to differ. I think there's one other place that's heavily mechanized, well, and that place Subway is Subway. Subway is fairly mechanized. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's a different experience. It's, it's I think... I like mechanized in, in regards to food because you, you have a certain expectation every time you go to have a similar experience, similar amount of food. It's not like I'm going to go to Tasty Sub tomorrow and have a completely different sub than the last time I went. Right. And another thing you don't have to worry about at Tasty Sub is that they know how to wrap a sandwich properly. They know how to pull the bread together properly, and they know how to cut it properly. So you never have any issues there. It's not going to be a mess. No, have you ever not. Have you ever had a tuna sub there? No, I don't eat, no. You don't eat tuna? I eat, like, tuna the fish, but not tuna fish. Really? Yeah, like a tuna steak, I'll eat a tuna steak, but I will not eat 
that cat food. No, I will not eat. I will not eat cat food. Well, I happen to like cat food every once in a while. That's and, fine. Um, what's funny is like they they make a little mountain out of it on the sandwich. Like they'll they'll put a a blob on there, and then they take the knife and they make a triangle out of it every time. Oh, really? Yeah, it's it's wild to watch because it's like that's their standard for that sandwich. That's cool. There's definitely some like artisanship there. Something, man. I, I, if he starts making like a mountain out of it, like I don't know, the David, he'll make the David on my sandwich. <laughs> anyway, so, but I don't know what I'm getting at Tasty Sub. I've I've no idea. They've not done nutritional. I I could put it together. I could say, well, that's like an eight inch roll or a four inch roll or a six inch roll. Yeah, but you're never going to be accurate. I I could. I could even ask them what where their sources were for their food. I could I could have a conversation with the guy and probably come up with a very reasonable estimate. Or I can look at similar sandwiches elsewhere, do some comparative analysis. You know, like I could look at a Wawa sandwich or a tasty sa or a uh, quick check sandwich, and add and remove ingredients and make it because I know what two pieces of cheese are. You know, it's like. I could do that guesswork, but because they're so mechanized, you would think that they would know precisely exactly what it was. Yeah, right. And exactly. just tell me. You know? Right. So I feel like it is increasingly a responsibility for uh, food, the food industry to pay attention to how I'm using their product. If, if I was a, a broken shards of glass company, it would be important for me to protect my customers by making sure that they wrap them in plastic or something uh, because I don't want to hurt my customers. As a basic rule of customer service, I don't want to hurt my customers. And so helping them is even better, you know. So how else could a food company help me but to make me more nutritionally aware? I always thought the resistance to this movement, too, was a little bit strange. Um, there, the, I know that like McDonald's was not happy about having to put caloric information on their stuff because of the revelation of how many calories a Big Mac has, for example. And um, the thing is that I don't think the Big Macs probably re were reduced in consumption after the publishing of their calories. Some people are just not going to look at those numbers. Right. Um, some people just really love having a Big Mac. And even though I'm nutritionally aware, if I was into eating Big Macs, I could take a look at those numbers and eat it appropriately and say, just say, I'm going to have this much less calories to eat today because I had this sandwich. So, but that's allowing me to make a choice. It's giving me more options as a consumer. Um, the thing is about it, that then publishing the calories for that sandwich doesn't really affect me because I probably wasn't going to eat a Big Mac anyway. You know? Right. And, you know, the funny thing is, is if you were to look at the McDonald's menu, I, I think the Big, the Big Mac is probably one of the least offenders when it comes to high calorie content. I'm sure there are other major, major offenders. Absolutely. And and some of them are really surprising. You know, there's as many calories in a in a chocolate shake as there is in a Big Mac, I think. Uh, far worse I would I would even argue uh, depending on your size even more. You know well, they come. They're like these immense things now. It's like it's a, a trough. Bucket. It's a horse trough. It is sad. It is. So Absolutely. I know that um, because you've said it several times on this podcast and we've had conversations about it, um, that your nutritional journey is, is really just kind of starting. What have you run into as far as customer service in the form of nutritional information? Um, for the most part, I mean, I, I, you know, to kind of talk to your, your point a little bit a couple of seconds ago about how the resistance to publishing the nutritional information was something that kind of bewildered you. And I'm somebody that subscribes to sort of a laissez-faire uh, governmental philosophy when it comes to government and business and interpret that as you will. 
Uh, but I, I absolutely do support the, uh, the publication of, of, of nutritional information. Well, I knew you were the person to talk to because you, you are interested in small government and um, reducing burden on the, on the uh, small business. And I, I respect that. Uh, however, you know, at a certain point, McDonald's is not a small business, you know? No, I, I, think, I think the limitation of a small business to be exempt from it it's kind of stupid. I mean, given the, the technological advances that are available to us, everybody's buying uh, their ingredients from somewhere. And those ingredients contain nutritional information, and they can assemble a proper uh, you know, nutritional guide. It, you know, it doesn't take money to, to – even if it's on your website. You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's got to be on the menu. But it's not about money at all. It's about awareness. It's just sure. about taking time. And uh, so if it's, if it's going to be the law, and I'm fine with that, make everybody have to do it. Well, I don't see why there should be an exception, and, and I, don't, I don't get it. You know, it should be all or nothing. One because- argument that I heard that was interesting was about this idea of a chef who – has an artistic hand who puts a little bit more oil on one day and a little bit less oil on another. And there was no accurate way to track, you know, what that experience might be like on one day versus another calorically speaking. Well, I guess, I mean, maybe then there could be an exception to the rule in the sense that, uh, what's the, 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 uh, food word that I'm looking for when you go and it's, you know, chef's choice. There's a, a French word for that. You know, you pay, uh, was a prefix? Yeah, yeah. If if you're a prefix menu, then you, maybe then that's your that's your out. But if you're serving a specific recipe that is made day in and day out the same way, there's no reason why you know, like you said, a tasty sub shop, very mechanized in the way that they make the sub. You get the same amount of meat, a hearty amount of meat. The bread is the same amount of bread, same length. Why not? You know, why can't they just say this is a 800 calorie sub, you know, or a thousand calories? It's not a big deal. And personally, you know, like I said, I'm not somebody that religiously logs my uh, nutritional, my caloric intake. You know, I do it here and there sometimes, but, you know, I kind of do a running tally in my head loosely to see, you know, I know that I try to stay below, you know, 2,300 to 2,200 calories a day. And, you know, if I can ballpark it like and know that I had a thousand calories for lunch and a thousand calories for dinner then you know I'm all right you know and uh you know I can't do that if I go to a lot of places that I go to I mean like Hoagie Haven is a is there's a place that needs it with the 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 fat lady the the Sanchez I mean those sandwiches are amazing from a caloric standpoint but I would love just for just for hahas, let me see. Like the the was it the block, which is eight eggs and cheeseburgers. Like what is that? I want to know. I gotta know. I would love. Oh, I never eat it, but out. I want to know. We ought to do it as an experiment. We ought to go in there and and do the math because like every every egg is seventy calories. An average hamburger is like hundred and fifty calories. And all their bread is from Italian people's bakery. Uh, and when you get the, when you buy a sub, they give you the bag that has the nutritional information for the roll on it. So we really could do it. Oh yeah, and and probably get sued by the Hoagie Haven. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, so that's that's where I'm at. I mean, I, like I said, I, I'm a supporter of of them publishing the information. I think it's uh, does it need to be on the menu? I don't know. I I, I think it. If you're uh, doing, if you're putting it on your website, I think with smartphone technology and and you know cellular data, it's it's at your fingertips. Better than nothing. Yeah, and I sure. think that's fine. I mean, if you want to know, as long as it's publicly available in an easy place. I mean, it's f- easy to find. You go to any website, Wendy's, Burger King, uh, Hula Hands, whatever it is. There's a link on the front page of the site. It's easy to find, easy to read. And that's actually one thing I noticed. Like, you know, I picked up a Fitbit when you were first talking about them. Yeah. And, you know, was religiously tracking my food just to see what the capabilities of the Fitbit website were. And that was one thing that really surprised me was that actually how much uh, thought these restaurant conglomerates have put into their nutritional 
guides on their websites. You know, some even have like a, a meal calculator where you can. Oh yeah. You know, it's not just like the, I always think of that they would do just the PDF file with the black and white text. You know, with the bars. That there's there's some companies that have really gone over and above. Like Kadoba is another example where they have yeah. like a whole interactive. Kadoba, I got it down to a 320 calorie burrito. I know, I'm you were talking about that. I go, remember, I, t I told you about this on the podcast. Right. 320 calories. Right. And all because of their building website. That's Fantastic. phenomenal. So I think it, that, you know, it, a lot of companies are taking it seriously, and I think that's that's really great service. But I don't know if it's really publicized. You know, I feel like companies could do a little bit more of a better job saying, hey, you know, you can go to our website, and we have these great tools at your disposal. You know, and I think that would be the only thing I would change. But it's I think it's interesting that you say that because I think part of the reason why they don't advertise it is because of the sphere that they have. This thing where they think you're going to find out how many calories that you've been eating. You're going to stop coming here, and you're going to find a new nutritional lifestyle and never step in here again. And the reality is that that it doesn't have to be that way. You you can offer better choices for one thing, but that's what I was just gonna say, you know, if, if that's what happens, I mean, remember what happened with McDonald's in the late '80s? They got a lot of guff for being unhealthy, and what did they do? They offered the McLean, right? Which remember, it it didn't have lettuce; it had um, kale, and there was a a seaweed. Why, why would they do that though? It was a seaweed blend in the meat, I think, as well too. Um, they, they actually have a veggie burger. When did that happen? They've had it for years. Burger you, you King have to ask for it very specifically, and they don't have it in all restaurants. Oh, that's Burger right. King has a fantastic veggie burger that's uh, a garden burger. Yeah, right. Yeah, my girlfriend is a big fan of that one. Yeah. Yeah. I but mean, I was like you that said, I didn't know that there were some stores that actually had one. I didn't know that. Yeah, I've, I've never run into a Burger King that doesn't have it, but I've I've run into several McDonald's that are like, we don't have the veggie burger. Right. They, I don't they, think there are any in our areas. But, I mean, there's not that many McDonald's in Mercer County anyway. Um, and the ones that we have, I know, don't have them. So, like, that's an example. Like, I went to Primo, and there was a list of stuff that I could get as a non-meat eater or less meat eater. You walk into a McDonald's and you ask them what I can get if I don't want to eat meat. And they say, why are you in here? And I say, no, 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 sir. What choices do I have as a, as a vegetarian uh, consumer? And they're like, well, we have fries and we have fish salad and, you know. It's and like garden they, salad. No, they have, they have like a chef salad and like, you know, a garden salad. But if you want an apple pie, french fries, or and the apple pie probably has lard in it. <laughs> probably. Uh, french fries or a side salad, you're, you're good. You're golden. Or apples, you know, because they, they still have apples. apples. But they are not really interested in anybody who doesn't eat meat. No, and that's their prerogative. That's fine. You know, they've gotten by this long without it, and Burger King has offered it to differentiate themselves. And and Taco Bell, that's the other thing, too. There are certain things at Taco Bell that are vegan, uh, which blows my mind as well. Um, well, really, if you think about it, their regular taco is fairly vegan because it's not really meat. Yeah, I mean, but you tell a vegan is not going to eat a taco at Taco Bell. No. <laughs> Let's let's get real. You know what I mean? No, yeah. But my my point is is that each of these other companies are offering things to differentiate themselves from like the fast food stigma that McDonald's like embodies. Right. And even companies like Doritos, like Dor uh, Doritos, the sweet chili, the sweet spicy chili Doritos that came out a few years ago, like three years ago, they're the first vegan Doritos. Really. Yeah, they don't build them that way. It's not advertised that way. But um, when they were when negative. they were released, it was a hot issue in the vegan community about that. There might even be a negative uh, pushback because people who are not vegan very often feel the same way about vegan that people who hear organic and think of it negatively 
have a, like a negative reaction. And with education, you find out that you know that many of the things you eat are vegan. You, they're just not built that way. Right. And many of the things that you eat may be organic if if you ended up in the wrong part of the supermarket or the right part of the supermarket, I should say. Right. But um, people often associate it with elitism or you know whatever, and it it doesn't have to be that way. No, no, you're right. It doesn't. And uh, I think I think things are changing, at least in the Northeast and the West Coast. We we know it, it's in the East Coast. These these attitudes are changing for sure. You know, with the proliferation of Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and. Uh, and I'm sure there's other places that I'm, that we don't even know about because they're not in our area. Whole Earth Market. Whole Earth Market, Princeton, dude. Where's that? Whole I don't know. Whole Earth Market, Princeton. It is at uh, Harrison and Nassau. And they know what is up. They know exactly what's up. They have fresh uh, food in a deli. They have... I get probably like twice a week I'll walk over there and get a rainbow wrap which is a tortilla wrap and it's got like raw veggies in it but um, they use like hummus with it and it's just like fresh and delicious and they made it there that day and they throw them out at the end of the day and the hot foods like they have a couple soups on every t every day and they have a couple of like um vegetarian or vegan or not even necessarily vegetarian or vegan but whole food items that are right there and uh, delicious fresh attentive responsible food that's good no I didn't know that another thing that's coming to Princeton too you know that I think also embodies this this new trend that we're talking about uh, there's a farm to table restaurant coming to Witherspoon Street. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's where the old La Hare was. Um, oh, wow. So, uh, you know, I don't really know much about the farm-to-table concept, but obviously its name kind of explicitly states what, what it is. But there is, you know, as we've talked about in the, in the in before, is there's this kind of, like, new trend that's emerging that's gaining a lot of momentum, like hyper-local food sourcing and is, you know, like really kind of becoming a big thing. You know, we talked about uh, people in communities pooling their resources to purchase a full cattle and uh, going to local, you know, orchards for, for cheese and vegetables and because, you know, uh, for the freshness and the, you know, and the local business aspect of it. There's a whole bunch of reasons. And now... There's so many reasons. I mean, it put, I'm putting money in my backyard as opposed to putting my money somewhere in the middle of the country. Right. I'm causing less pollution because that meat doesn't have to travel across the country. Right. I'm helping out my community because I'm putting money into my community. I am likely supporting a local farm that uh, because it is not overcrowded with animals... Or um, or even vegetables that are uh, processed in a in a factory style in an overly factory style means that there's less processing. Less processing is better because less processed food tends to be um, closer to the way it was intended. And that's what I'm glad you said that because when we were talking in our last episode and we were talking about. I was making the point about how I I, I was uh, suspicious of the the qual the, the nutritional quality of produce in wall in a Walmart, and that was exactly the point that I'm speaking I was speaking to. And I didn't really uh, clarify that that well, and you know we we had a disagreement about that. But you just you just basically proved the point I was trying to make, and that is is that when you when you have produce coming from Guatemala or wherever at these big corporate farms, or even if it's not a corporate farm, but it's traveling a great distance, the food has to, it, it, it's going to wilt, you know, wilt, you know what I mean? It, it may not be inedible. It may still be, you know, quote unquote fresh or, or whatever. But if I'm going to get a, a, you know, a head of cabbage uh, or a head of kale in Lawrenceville versus a head of kale that comes from Japan, uh, which one's going to be fresher? It's going well, to be the one from Lawrenceville because it was probably picked within the last, 
you know, 48 hours or something, you know? Exactly right. And the, the, the thing about it, too, is that they have found ways, for example, to make food wilt slower. But the way that they make food wilt slower, of course, is by doing all these weird processes to it and maybe adding ammonia or whatever to, sure. to the food in such a way as to not affect the taste, but certainly to affect the chemical uh, makeup of the food. Right. And so all of a sudden we're eating ammonia and you wonder why. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great point. And I think... Ammon and not to say that anybody's using ammonia in order to make food not wilt. I'm just saying, like, who, who knows what is going on in order to make apples stay red and oranges stay fresh and all this stuff while they travel from other countries. Well, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation that's going on around about food for sure. I mean, somebody was trying to tell me a few months ago that like Tropicana orange juice has formaldehyde in it or something. And I was like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. It's possible. Yeah, I know. But it, it, it's, but my point is, is that if that was the case, there would be major, I mean, there would be other people in the mainstream media discussing that, just like people have put to rest many of the other rumors that have been brought uh, forward about food, you know, like... Right. I haven't McDonald's heard about that particular their... rumor, but, like, did you watch Food Inc. yet? Not yet, but we're, we're going to. Yeah, you'll, you'll see some of this kind of a thing explained very, very well. It's got bias in the film, and yeah. the bias is my bias, but... It's definitely an, a relatively even-handed documentary uh, about the about the processed food industry, and the other thing is like if you have an orange tree and or the local farm has citrus, and you get that uh, citrus from your local farm, there's less chance that there's formaldehyde in that local farms produce yeah whether it's because, true or not whether it's true or not and uh, formaldehyde is probably a bad example but there are many processes that are um, that they talk about in this film as a way to keep food fresh that don't have to happen as much if the farm is down the street right or if the farm is connected to the restaurant or the farm is you know exactly right I get it and I'm willing to pay an extra dollar if it means that I have less chemicals in my body. You know? Yeah, and that's, I mean, I mean, I'm all for that too. I mean, I, I, the thing for me always was convenience, you know, and, you know, is it, is it easy to get to? Is it in a convenient location? I mean, in Tom's River, where, where I spent a majority of my life, uh, a former uh, agrarian uh, community, you know, in the, you know, 19, in the uh, 1970 early on, it was chicken coops and, and farms and cattle and, and, and then in the proliferation of the community after 1970, it became more uh, suburban. Uh, there's still, you know, there's still a lot of uh, farm roots in Tom's River. There's still many farms that operate today. There's a, a major, um, there's a company called Wallach's that, off, that, that, that runs a farm market. They're the largest maker of eggs in Ocean County. They make their own eggs and they have a, a but they're they don't offer a full slate of farming options you know like like a terhune orchards does or or you know the any of the other farms that we go to in mercer county they they specialize in a certain product and you, that product is is a, of, of high quality for sure but there's no other real options in tom's river that serve that and that's unfortunate, you know, and luckily in Mercer County, for whatever reason, you know, there, there is a large farming, uh, um, history here. And I've, and I, and I, like I said, I've lived here, this is 12 years now I've lived in Mercer County and just in, within the last 18 months, you know, driving through Hopewell and, and Flemington and Chesterfield and all these other surrounding communities that I never was in before I'm really what realizing what a huge farming community there is here in Mercer County which oh, is absolutely. amazing we're, we're incredibly lucky from a nutritional standpoint to be where we are too yeah we are and you know that's why I think it's it's I'm surprised that actually it's taken so long for a 
farm to table restaurant to open up in our area because you know, with all this, with all this farming going on, I mean, Halo, Halo uh, Farms too, another major large farm, probably a little more corporate farm because of the large quantities of uh, product that they produce, but still better than anything else you could get at a national grocery chain. Um, you know, even you know they are not participating in a, a farm to table. Well, that's not true. They have their ice cream pubs, which are kind of yeah. Farm to I mean, table, it, if you think it, about it. It may not be directly, you know, it's not like they have cows outside the Halo Pub, but... Um, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. And the Trenton Farmer's Market, you know, we're, we're, we're very lucky. We're not as lucky as some other uh, areas, but, you know, I'm not complaining. Uh, there are certainly choices for my nutritional lifestyle, and I have a fairly strict nutritional lifestyle. So, um... I can't complain, I, I, and I think that as awareness grows and as uh, a sense of the the uh, danger of continuing to produce food in the way that we have in the last 50 years or so, increasing obesity, increasing uh, cruelty to animals, increasing, there's a lot of reasons why we really need to examine more we're doing yeah I couldn't agree with you more and uh, you know I think like I said I think the Northeast and the West Coast are headed in the right direction of course you know there's gonna be pockets in these areas that are gonna buck the trend but I think a majority of, of the people that live in our areas are aware of what's going on they see the writing on the wall and they are they are jumping on the bandwagon for this and I think we're going to be in a good place in 10 years for sure. Uh, it's the rest of the country that really worries me, you know, middle America, the South. And, uh, I, you know, I hope these, these ideas and these um, new trends spread there. But, you know, with the great distance between communities that, that the South and Midwest face, it makes it very difficult. You know, a very, uh, one, of, one of my mentors a former professor of mine, uh, after retiring from Ryder, moved to Oklahoma, and he, you know, I remember he, who I know exactly who you're talking about. And he told me about how the closest store that they have is a Walmart that's an hour and a half away, and if he wants to go to a Best Buy or anything like that, it's three hours. So how are you going to do local sourced produce if you're traveling an hour and a half to three hours just to go to a, a electronic store? You know what I mean? And yeah. And that's a lot of a lot of people in those areas, you know, face those challenges, and it makes it difficult. And you know, there's still a lot of parts of our country that have never seen a McDonald's because the population is so small in their area. You know what I mean? They have to travel a great distance to a McDonald's. You know, like there was just a commercial, a Taco Bell commercial, about how they flew a truck of for Taco Bell into a part of Alaska because there's no Taco Bells in Alaska. You know what I mean? And that's a crime, Sean. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. That's a crime. But my, but my point is, is that because of the remote nature of Alaska and the difficulty in sourcing ingredients there, there, there is no Taco Bell. You know what I mean? So it's not that far-fetched to think about all the other parts of our country that don't have any other options except a Walmart. You know what I mean? Yeah. By the way, how was Mochi today? was good. It was very good. After watching uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, it's been on my mind. I wanted sushi. Yeah, and, uh, I stopped over there like twice last week. Well, that's good. I did. I, it wish, I, got, I wish I got more sushi because usually when I go there for dinner, I get like three or four rolls and then yeah. I eat them all. But yeah. Well, they have a vegetarian platter. Oh, man. So good. Love that place. Well, good. So uh, is there anything else you want to talk about tonight? Well, we got we got 10 minutes, really. I'd like to talk briefly about the United States Postal Service, if we can, because I've had a very rough rough week with them. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Um, my girlfriend and I are participating in a secret Santa with her family that lives in a 
uh, extreme it's not a remote secret anymore, Sean. What's that? It's not a secret anymore. No. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess not. <laughs> they live in an extreme remote part of Maine, like literally the the northernmost tip of Maine, and another example of a part of our country where. They have to travel hours just to get to a Walmart or any other, you know, retail experience. Anyway, we have this giant 19-pound box of, of, of Christmas gifts for about four or five members of her family up there that we have to send. So my girlfriend packed the box. I went to the Postal Service website. I printed out a label, slapped it on there, and they, they have, if you pr use priority mail, complimentary package pickup, schedule pickuping. You know, and I've used it many times in the past I have scheduled this package to be picked up twice this week and both uh -huh. times it hasn't been picked up and both times I've received an email saying that it was picked up so I called the main customer service line for the United States Postal Service and the woman was very apologetic but she told me that this was an issue I would have to take up with my local post office, and she gave me the direct line, and I no will have to call way. the post office tomorrow. So this is not the first time the Lawrenceville post office has screwed me over. This is the place over on Route 1, right? Yes, Business Route 1. There was another time where... Have you ever had to stand in line in that post office? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun. It's the the worst experience ever. And actually, I'm so glad you asked that because the last time that I had to stand in line there was because uh, we got a notice on our door saying that we had a package for my girlfriend, Crystal. And she was getting a birthday gift from her friend, Emily, who lives in San Diego. So I said, listen, I will go to the post office before I go to work, and I will pick it up for you. So they I forgot went. to leave on the note on your door that it wasn't there yet. <laughs> no, it wasn't <laughs> that. So I waited in line to in the post office at 7 o'clock in the morning. There was about eight people there. So I was there for about 45 minutes. And uh, I finally got to the counter. I handed my slip in. They gave me my package. Well, no, the woman said, hold on, your package is so big that I can't just give it to you over the counter. You have to meet me in the lobby, and I'll, I'll put it outside the door for you in the lobby. I said, okay. So I go into the lobby. She's there in the lobby. She goes, here's your box. I take the box. We go home. Three days later, my girlfriend gets around to opening the package because we were very busy. We didn't have a lot of time. It was a huge box. We didn't, you know. She opens it up. And there's a stainless steel decorative car bumper in the box. Like it's a, a huge metal, like literally just as big as a real car bumper. That's supposed to be mounted on someone's wall with, a, you know, had like a decorative vanity license plate that said like hotness Crystal or something. Or and something. my girlfriend calls her friend on the phone and she's opening the box and she's like, what is this car bumper that says hotness that you bought me? And she's like, I didn't, that's not what I got you. So we look at the box and we look at the shipping label and it wasn't for us. It was someone else's piece of mail. And it wasn't even someone in Ewing. It was someone in like Lawrenceville. The, the words of my street were not even the same as the person. And, and the person's name was not even... Crystal or Crystal's last name or my name. It was like something completely, there was no way wow. that they could screw this up. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess I got to go back to the post office now. So I, the next morning I pack it up and I wait in line again at seven o'clock in the morning, eight people, 45 minutes later, I get to the counter. Were you holding on to the bumper? Yeah. Oh yeah. I had the box. I had it all in the box. I'm holding the box. And the guy behind the counter, I don't know if you've ever gone to the post office. There's a, an, uh, a, a guy there. He's very happy to be working at the post office, and I mean that in a very genuine way. He, you know, God bless you, uh, you know, at the every end of every transaction. Nicest guy, very personable. Very, definitely the mo most pleasant employee I've ever encountered at the Lawrenceville post office. Okay. So I get up to the counter, and I say to him, Hi. I just picked this package up about four days ago, and uh, it's not for me. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, take a look at the label. 
He goes, yeah? And I go, that's not my girlfriend's name, that's not my name, and more importantly, that's not my address. And he goes, what? I go, yeah, I had a pickup slip, I handed it in, and the woman behind the counter gave me this package. And he was like, he was so blown away about how badly they screwed this up. He was like uh, laughing at me. He was like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. So he says, all right, hold on, hold on. Do you, he's like, do you have, you know, a license so I can see your address and I'll try and find the package. And I go, yeah. So he goes in the back. Scheme, actually. What's that? This would be a good scam. Yeah, it would. So he goes in the back. He gets, he finds the original package, thankfully. And he hands it to me and he goes, I'm so glad we found this. Thank you for returning this. I really appreciate you doing this. And I was well, like, oh, no problem. What are you going to do with the hotness bumper? Uh, <laughs> so, so I get my package and I'm leaving. I'm, I'm outside in the parking lot and this heavy set man comes running at me shouting, Mr. Piotrowski, Mr. Piotrowski, Mr. Piotrowski. And I'm like, I turn around and this guy comes running at me and he's like, oh, thank God I caught you. Mr. Piotrowski, my name is so-and-so. I'm the manager of the Lawrenceville post office. Oh no. And I'm like, Oh, hi. And he's like, I just want to apologize for this mix up. I have no idea how this happened. I assure you we will be looking into it. So this never happens again. We'll pay your mail fraud charges. He proceeds to tell me now this is, this is the part of this, my favorite part of the story. He says that they realized that they made the mistake shortly after I left and they had no way of getting in touch with me. He says, we Googled your name and we saw that you were a professor at Ryder University and we also found your Twitter account. We called Ryder University and we spoke to someone there and you might be, you should probably be getting a message from us through Ryder. You know, we tried to track you down. He's like, we even tweeted at you to, to have you return the package. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, we're so thankful for returning the package for us. We're so embarrassed. The other person actually called and was waiting for the delivery. And we were like, we don't have it here. And he was like, it was so embarrassing for us. And you really helped us out a lot by returning this. And I can't thank you enough. I said, no problem. So... That was uh, over a year ago. Still have never seen the tweet that they supposedly tweeted at me, nor did I ever get a message at Ryder University saying that the Lawrenceville Post Office called me. So this is what I got to deal with tomorrow about my packages that were never picked up. Well, I wonder if you had, if you were still a Stamps.com customer. Yes. If this would have even begun to have been an issue. Not this recent story you were telling me about, but your current situation. Well, I, honestly, I think it would be because it still would be a problem because the problem is not with the Postal Service's system that is used to schedule the pickups. The it's problem the lies in the Lawrenceville Post Office either not communicating to my letter carrier that I have a package that needs to be picked up or my letter carrier is a lazy piece of shit and doesn't want to pick the, the package up. Because, you know, it's a big package. I'm not leaving it on my front step. I'm leaving it on my deck because there is a place on the scheduling of the pickup where you can say, literally, it's a radio button. My package is at my back door. Wow. So I, there's no reason why he can't go back there because it's an option for me to pick. And so we will see what happens. But, you know, we hear all the time now how the Postal Service is operating at a $4 billion loss every year, and they're thinking about stopping mail delivery on Saturdays and blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, UPS and FedEx have delivery down to a perfect science. So why does the Postal Service suck? Well... I don't know that it always does. Uh, I agree with you. They're, they are definitely under the gun from other organizations who are doing delivery. And that those competitors to that business are only going to become more powerful as time goes on. 
Not less so. I mean, the U.S. Postal Service has been reducing its service for a long time. Right. Because of the, you know, if, if you think about parcels as the, you know, if you think about what the U.S. Postal Service did most of the time, it was letter exchange. Letter exchange has just been, you know, unless it's specifically an important piece of paper or unless you are embracing your ink on paper skills you know you're not you're not sending letters no the letter industry has been obliterated because of email right because of email and other you know and i think that that's going to <laughs> continue to extend you know you think about 3d printing and the internet of things and there's going to be a point at which i'm going to something like amazon ordering a unique 3D model of something, downloading it and printing it, using my own materials and calling it done, you know? But right now, we're, we're just not there. It's, not, it's still unique and special and whatever. But how many items that I have bought from Amazon, not many actually, but how many items could I theoretically replicate from my home 3D printer in the future as opposed to going to Amazon waiting two days for it? It's, it's definitely on the horizon. I mean, I don't, I personally, uh, I mean, I'm not knowledgeable enough about, I mean, I know 3D printing, I know it exists, I know its capabilities, but I, I don't know what the, the fullest capabilities of 3d printing are i mean is it can i print it can i print a xbox 360 game out, out of it no probably not i know i can print a, you know no, a chair you could, you could print a case for your phone right oh yeah totally that i do understand like anytime you've ever bought plastic like just consider that a thing of the past yeah right that's and that's what i think of when i think of 3d printing i think of like you said a phone case you know, a key ring or a wallet or whatever. You know what I mean? Really, items any that... multiple item, anything that you've ever bought that is made of a single material or two things that are snapped together in, you know, individual materials, that can be replicated in that way. You know, there's probably a time when you'll be able to print something like rubber, probably a time when you'll be able to, obviously, because they're doing that now. Yeah. Um, so I think that things that are cast, things that are uh, machined, you know, that why would I not be able to do that from home in the future just by grabbing either an open source or a for-purchase DRM-protected item? Um, think about the sharing that happens with that. If I, if I start sharing 3D models of things and me and my friends start to print them out. Like let's say that I'm in grade school or high school, you know, all of a sudden there's, there's these objects that you would have purchased out at a store or online. Yeah. And there are companies that are doing this now. They, they have a 3D interface. They allow you to make changes to, uh, and add items that are three-dimensional, three-dimensional model items, and then they send you the physical object. You can completely bypass that, that process just by downloading the 3D model, saying print, and being done. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, a, a couple months ago, one of the founders of the Pirate Bay said that within, within five to seven years, he sees the future of the Pirate Bay, Pirate Bay being sharing 3D items that can be printed at home. Like, that'll be the major item that'll be shared on the Pirate Bay. I agree. I agree completely. And, you know, you think about the way that uh, we have turned into a visual society um, online. That's only going to extend. And, you know, with capability comes popularity. You know, I think that as 3D printing is something that everybody has, the novelty of that will turn into interests in that. And the same people who are crazy about craft 
books or uh, uh, scrapbooking, you know, will will all of a sudden start to learn how to use Blender and 3D Studio Max and start to build like little th things. It's it's an interesting time, and then after we get past that, it'll start to get into utilitarian realms as opposed to just hobby realms. Right. Uh, another note I wanted to add in regards to the U.S. Postal Service, back in our episode where we talked about stamps.com and I sang the praises of uh, tastyvapor.us, I wanted to say that I made uh, the folks at Tasty Vapor aware of our episode they then watched it, and uh, Jeff, the president of the company, contacted me back and said, hey, thanks a lot for the shout-out. I just wanted to let you know that's not Stamps.com at all. That's just us. Oh. We let our customers know what the status is of their uh, products because we care that you know. That is not something that is part of the suite of products that Stamps.com offers. So wow. I just wanted to simultaneously apologize and amplify my thanks to tastyvapor.us for their great products and service. Well, thank you, uh, Jeff at Tasty Vapor, for watching our episode and giving us the correct information. Uh, hopefully, we'll, you'll send this over to them so that they know that we uh, corrected ourselves. Yeah, certainly will. I certainly and will. Uh, maybe we can uh, set up an interview or something with uh, Tasty Vapor and expand on that conversation a little bit. That would be really great because, I mean, the thing that we always talk about is technology mediation uh, in the benefit of customer service, and they are doing it right. Sounds like it would be a perfect episode. Hey, are we uh, teasing the possible thing that we talked about? Not yet. No, we have something really big in the works for you guys. We, we don't even want to tease it because we don't know if it's going to come through, but uh, it was something really huge. I think if it does happen, it's going to blow this podcast up in a big way. In a big way. So not to be jerks and, and be vague, and we just don't want to say something that might not happen and then look like Yeah, because uh, it, it could make us look bad. It could make them look bad. Sure, totally. So when we know more information, we will absolutely be r drumming up all kinds of excitement for it. Uh, but we are, we are holding off. Uh, we are still trying to finalize things or even get confirmation that it's going to be a go. But go. As, as we know more, we will let you know for sure. Great. Okay, John, another great episode as usual. As always, sir. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in again. And we'll see you next week on the Customer in the Service. Thanks, John. Thank you, John.